week in the boardroom. Brought to you by Corporate Board Member and host NYSE Euronext, along with Governance Knowledge Partners, the Center for Audit Quality, and Grant Thornton, and contributing partners, National Investor Relations Institute, and the Society of Corporate Secretaries and Governance Professionals. Welcome to this edition of This Week in the Boardroom. I'm T.K. Kerstetter with Corporate Board Member, and we have a special guest and a special show today to give you. In fact, this is so special that we've decided to turn it into a two-part series since uh, we're not sure that we can squeeze it all into one. Um, please join me in welcoming Rich C Richard Ketchum, who's the Chairman and Chief Executive Officer of FINRA, which is the Financial Industry Regulatory Authority. Um, Rick, welcome to the show. Thanks, TK. Great to be here. Well, I think it, um, first of all, let me give the background of uh, Rick here because I want to make sure you know how qualified it is for us to have this conversation. Rick is the, um, in addition to being the CEO of FINRA, he had been the CEO of NYSE Regulation and before that had served as counsel of the Corporate and Investment Bank of Citigroup. Now prior to that, so that he could have a view from the other <laughs> side here, he was also president of the uh, NASDAQ stock market, also served as president of NA NASD. And just to make sure that your foundational base was perfect in this sense, you spent 14 years at the SEC, eight of which you were director of market regulation. So you have looked at this thing from all sides, but I think people know the, the SEC, I think they know Citibank, I think they know NASDAQ, I think they know the NYSE. I'm not sure that our viewing audience knows completely what the responsibility is for FINRA. So I think that's a great place to start. Let's first set the foundation of what FINRA is. Sure, that's a great question, TK. First, FINRA came to existence from a merger of the NESD's regulatory program and the New York Stock Exchange's regulatory program to eliminate duplication and to provide uh, a more complete oversight of the broker-dealer industry. What does it do? It's part of a, it, it is essentially a, a non-governmental regulator that's the front line oversight for the securities industry. Uh, we operate in a private public partnership with the SEC uh, where we're the front line doing all the exams or, or most of the exams with respect to broker dealers that do business with the public, addressing their sales practice, how they handle and, and how they push products, uh, and also looking at their f financial issues and their financial compliance with regulations. In addition, we conduct the market surveillance, if you, if you will, look at the market integrity issues for all of the New York Stock Exchange and NYSE ARCA equity markets, all of the NASDAQ markets, uh, and as well, we do the surveillance with respect to all the activity that occurs away from exchanges uh, with respect to large firms and what's commonly called dark pools. Uh, we do a lot of other things, but those are the key core missions uh, from, if you will, FINRA is all about investor protection and market integrity. So you have enforcement responsibilities as well. We do. So how would you, when somebody looks to you, are you, do you work hand in hand with the SEC? Um, just how exactly does that relationship sure. work? It's, it's a very, very close partnership. We're working the SEC in, in two ways. And I say we're taking, with respect to much of the activity from a broker-dealer standpoint, where they, where they place customers in unsuitable investments, uh, where, they, where they create exposure from the standpoint of their financial activities and the like, uh, we are usually the disciplinary organization and we're bringing the enforcement actions directly. In addition, one of our key missions is to try to identify instances of fraud with respect to more speculative companies uh, and with respect to manipulation in the market. Often that's conducted not, uh, or the, the key participants are not all broker dealers and many of them aren't at all. Uh, so there, we're providing referrals to the SEC where we see market manipulation, where we see insider trading, uh, and where we see instances where, where firms may be engaging in fraudulent activity uh, or companies putting out uh, distortive information. So, so it's very, very much a close partnership with the SEC. Well, now that you've admitted to that, that lets me ask the tough question, because um, with all that we've been through with the financial crisis of late, why should corporate issuers 
feel any better about there being solutions or preventions about what happened in the future versus what we went through that certainly had its impact on our economy and our businesses? Well, it's not only a tough question, it's a fair question. And, and, and that th this last six years has been a frustrating period for any regulator. And no regulator could be happy with, with when you look at the range of conflict issues, the range of mis-selling issues, uh, and, and government policy mistakes. Uh, uh, we have a lot to do and do better. Uh, I guess why people should feel better is th that we, like the SEC, have really revamped how we approach our program. Our exams are more risk-based. They're focused in instances where customers really can get hurt. They're very much focused on new products and the concerns over structured products and others that, that can raise systemic issues from the standpoint of, uh, of not, o not only for, for customers, uh, but for firms and with failures for, for the country as a whole and the global environment. Uh, we, we're using a better, better efforts from a technology standpoint to, to have more closer surveillance with respect to those firms. And of course, later on in this program, we'll talk a little bit about uh, how we've changed the way we look at, uh, at market activity. Uh, so let's be honest, regulators will never identify the next problem correctly uh, on a 100% basis. But I think people should feel better that, that the way we focus our program, the way the SEC focuses its program is much more on a risk basis, and much more focused on new activities of firms that may cause risk. Rick, during your career, you've been on all different sides of sort of the boardroom issues. You probably had a time in your career you thought that there was too much regulation. You probably had a time in your career you, when you thought there wasn't enough regulation. You've had certainly had the experience of being in many boardrooms. And there's two things I'm curious about, curious about in your opinion. Number one is what is the appropriate level of regulation? How, how, would, how, how do we come to grips with that? Because right now I think people feel overwhelmed. But maybe the more important question for our audience is, you know, boards have been under great scrutiny and transparency and whatever. Sure. The public image after 2008, 2009, 2010 uh, are basically that boards are asleep at the switch. Um, we know that, the, that, that as a generality, that's not the case, that people are really trying to do a good job. But sort of talk about the regulation and then talk about the situation that directors sort of find themselves in today and is there, how do they sort of work their way out of that? Sure, well, it's, it's, it's great questions and not easy to answer quickly. Uh, you know, I, I, I think first, uh, as I look, and, and I go back at the SEC in the Times uh, when, when uh, issues were about things like one share, one vote uh, in, in an environment where, where really shareholder oversight and impact on a company was dramatically less than it is today. Uh, I look at the environment today and I look at the changes that have occurred, particularly as a result of Sarbanes-Axley and changes in uh, both the New York Stock Exchange and NASDAQ listing requirements, particularly with respect to the questions of exactly the definition of independent directors. I think you have an environment that is way more responsive than it's ever been before. I, I, I see both directors that are more truly independent. Uh, I, see an, I see an environment where they accept that their role is, is not to second guess management, but to much more be focused on the incentives that may result in management making bad decisions, and be focused, whether that be compensation, whether that be pressures from, from, uh, from earnings or, or, or liquidity or a variety of other things and much more focused on risk. Uh, and I, if, I, if I look at where boards were 25 years ago versus the inquiry and, and, and the oversight of boards from the standpoint of truly trying to understand uh, not only the opportunities for growth for a business but also the risks in a business, I think we've come a long way. I think we all have to recognize and, and be honest in admitting, just as for regulators, these things is hard, this is hard for directors. Uh, and no one can expect directors to be able to substitute their, the level of knowledge that exists with respect to senior management. What you can expect them to do is to be more actively involved in demanding that senior management define their core risks, define their exposure, and define the mitigation steps they're, they're, they're taking. And I think there, TK, I see, I see an, an activist boardroom uh, that is dramatically an improvement, which is to not to say that it, that it doesn't have to continue to have accountability, but I think we have the opportunity for boards to, to accept the accountability in a way 
that didn't exist 20 years ago. So when you look at the regulation part of that, is it fair to say that you're trying to strike that balance between how do I protect the consumers and the markets sure. without creating undue burden, you know, so the, the so the boards can carry out their true task of, you know, improving the bottom line and and protecting the shareholders. Absolutely, I you know I. I uh, all regulation are difficult questions. Obviously, there were pieces of Sarbanes-Oakley 404 and the like uh, that, that raised significant cost impact and, and, and great frustration at the time it was implemented. But I think you look back at some of the things like 404 and the, the, the structure that was provided, it allowed board members to do a better job from the standpoint of, of having comfort with respect to the controls that existed in the company. I, I think you, you got to look at each regulatory piece to, to ask whether additional uh, regulation reacting to the latest scandal is the right way to address things. And I, and I think that uh, I, I know just from our little part of the world looking at financial institutions, uh, we're trying to do a much clearer and much better effort from the standpoint of really trying to quantify the costs involved in our regulation uh, in a structured way that's maybe a little bit different than happened in the past. It would be refreshing if Congress did the same thing. Yeah, yeah, it sure would. Um, well, I can't let you leave knowing that this is a show um, primarily for board members. I can't let you leave without asking your opinion uh, about that. And basically, with all your travels, if you had to pass along some advice to a, a board, you know, board members today to say, you know, here would be my advice to make sure that you can do your fiduciary duty more effectively. Um, what, would you, what would you pass along? What piece of wisdom or advice would you pass along with all your experience? Well, I, I guess I look at my experience interacting with boards as, as in, in senior management and, uh, and being on boards. I think, I think the, the primary advice is, is very much the advice I would give to anybody stepping into a regulatory responsibility. I, the, you, you can't, no matter what your wisdom overall and, and, and your balance, you can't do a job unless you really understand the business of the company uh, that, uh, that, that you're overseeing from your fiduciary standpoint in the board. Uh, curiosity and, and a demand that, that uh, uh, the senior management really provides you a picture from the standpoint of that company and particularly demand that that picture is not only with respect to the opportunities but also with the risks. I think is critical. I, 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 my experience is in the securities industry, and, you, and, and from that standpoint, uh, particularly with respect to bank holding companies and, and some of the problems we've had uh, at a variety of times over the last 20 years. Uh, and I think that's, that's just one way of indicative, but you see, you see I instances again and again of, of institutions making the same type of mistakes, assumptions that things are different this time, assumptions that asset values will, uh, that, that have increased substantially in price uh, will remain there no matter what, assumptions that when liquidity disappears it doesn't, that, that it will d disappear sequentially as opposed to absolutely and almost instantaneously. Uh, and my advice would be uh, that, that, that the, the focus on the risks and the potential downsides of a business should occupy as much time for directors from this, not, not reaching your own judgments, you need to depend on senior management, but should occupy as much time for directors uh, as the opportunities and the chance for upside. Great advice. And I have about 100 more questions to ask you about the board. Uh, unfortunately, we're running out of time. Um, one of the things we do want to do in the next part two of this is start to talk about the markets a little bit that I'm sure our audience will be interested in. So um, we'll wrap up this part one and we'll get on to part two. So that will wrap up part one of uh, uh, this week in the boardroom. We'll be back again next week to take a look with Rick Ketchum uh, uh, about the markets and we hope you'll join us then. Thanks a lot. Join us again next week for This Week in the Boardroom, brought to you by Corporate Board Member and host NYSE Euronext, along with Governance Knowledge Partners, the Center for Audit Quality, and Fran Thornton, and Control.
contributing partners, National Investor Relations Institute, and the Society of Corporate Secretaries and Governance Professionals.